Travis Bader, and this is the Silvercore Podcast. Silvercore has been providing its members with the skills and knowledge necessary to be confident and proficient in the outdoors for over 20 years, and we make it easier for people to deepen their connection to the natural world. If you enjoy the positive and educational content we provide, please let others know by sharing, commenting, and following so that you can join in on everything that Silvercore stands for. If you'd like to learn more about becoming a member of the Silvercore club and community, visit our website at silvercore.ca. I am joined again by TED Talk alumni, owner of Sangudo Custom Meats and modestmeats.ca in Edmonton, the ever passionate, always enthusiastic Jeff Singer. Jeff, welcome back to the Silvercore podcast. Thanks for having me, Silvercore. Thanks for having me, Travis. It's great to be here. What's going on? Well, you know, this is going to be kind of fun. You know, the joys of doing things remotely. This is our second attempt at it, but I think we're able to do it with the internet speeds that we have. As long as we can converse, the upload at the end will be, uh, will be flawless. Okay. I look forward to seeing the finished product because it looks a little grainy, <laughs> but I'm happy. I'm happy. You can't see the imperfections. My wrinkles it. and crow's feet are... They're not, they're not apparent. So that's good. <laughs> so we were going to be recording this morning, but you know, it was a long weekend and all the rest. And we had both had some scheduling things that happened, but you had a pretty interesting morning. You had, uh, at work there. What, what were you up to? Well, Trav, you know, we've been owner, owner operators of Sanguto Custom Meat Packers, a slaughterhouse in rural Alberta for, we're in our 14th year. And uh, because of the Thanksgiving holiday there on Monday, we bumped our kill from, our normal kills are on Mondays and Fridays, and we bumped Monday's kill to to Tuesday this week. So we're kind of short of staff. It was myself and two of our four daughters. We call them the slaughter daughters. (laughs) And uh, and so we're we're hopping around to put up six big fat beef. We started at nine and we finished at about noon. Uh, so it's like half an hour, half an hour per beef from live in the barn to hanging in the rail or hanging on the rail in the cooler, which is good, but it's not great mm. because we like to get our, our total time from on the hoof to on the rail to down to 18 minutes. A great day is 15 minutes per beef. If we have a crew wow. of taller people, yeah, yeah, 15 minutes. It's not like skinning a moose in the bush. We, I had a friend who killed a moose uh, near Marathorpe and I... He's like, yeah, we, we were really quick. We got it all done in four hours. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I remember those days. Yep. Sounds about right. It helps that we have a chain hoist and all that stuff. When you have the goodies and you're indoors, it's quite a bit easier to make it, make it go more quickly. Um, and then we, we call it, there's a choreography to the dance, the, the dance of murder. And uh, my kids, uh, well, two, two or three of them, they say that we, can, we communicate telepathically. And it's not that. It's just that we all know what the next step is. So it's quite mm. a, it's like a team, team sport or you're covering a whole area uh, in the key in basketball and you know to stay out of the key and where the, where the like post up and then like, blood, <laughs> don't mm-hmm. get kicked <laughs> by a thrashing carcass and don't get sprayed by blood. <laughs> and then also uh, usually there's a carcass cleaner with a high pressure hose and they're spraying down the carcass and you have to stand in the right place to not get a shower, showered on all day. But we mm-hmm. got through it, Travis, and now here, here we are. Now here we are. Well, we, you and I were talking about waste meat, and I'm going to put my air quotes here for those who are listening, waste meat on whether in the slaughterhouse or with wild game, what people might leave behind, which maybe they shouldn't be. Um, let's, let's hear your yeah. thoughts on this. Travis, I love this topic. Um, so yeah, I mean, being in year 14 of killing animals twice a week, uh, there's no shortage of time to contemplate what's going into the garbage. And then my, my job also is to haul waste to the, we, we actually have a compost facility at, at Westlock that takes our organic waste and turns it into black soil. So there's, a, and that's been happening for a couple of years now. Mm. Uh, pr- previously, it had just been going to a landfill, which hurt, hurt my heart. Mm. Uh, but now anything that we can't eat goes to the landfill. But I, and that's being pulled by my stupid one ton diesel truck in a, in a hydraulic dumping trailer uh, to the dump. But I'm always keen on thinking about what, like, does it need to go to the dump and, you know, what's actual garbage and what could we glean something out of? Less from a financial uh, urgency and more from being, carrying the weight of all of the murdering that I've done on my shoulders. I just think if this animal has to die, uh, how do we get better at using more of the animal? 
And so mm. um, when you, you you would approach me and said, "Hey, do you want to do a do another chat chit chat? Um, what's kind of new in your world?" And we're getting better and better, or I would say, of evolving into being able to figure out ways to harvest more of the animal that wouldn't traditionally be used as food. So I would take you through something like you know kindergarten or early on. Uh, uh, whether you're a hunter or a, a, a meat meat production worker or whatever, like you, you're aware that there are pieces that you could probably eat. I remember when I was young and hunting, you know, f- I mean, for the first time a long time ago or watching watching dad dress out a moose when I was like six years old, um, he would save the liver and the heart. And that, and then whether or not that was ever cooked or cooked up or if it came home for the, the family dog or the pets or something like that, maybe that's that was probably how, how it, it got started. Like, well, that heart is all muscle and you can you can eat it. And we didn't really know how to prepare it well unless, you know, there's stuffed hearts. Certain family members or ethnic family members uh, up, uh, grandparents would say, oh, save the heart. And then Aboriginal uh, First Nations people uh, would say like, they they would prefer and and consider a delicacy the moose nose, which was crazy. Like it just seemed crazy to yes. us. Yes, but I I understand that a lot better now. That anything cartilaginous can be braised and turn into quite quite a nice uh, product that's happily edible. Um, that maybe like mainstream people or listeners would get in their in their Vietnamese noodle soup. So you have mm. beef beef tendon braised in a in a in a Vietnamese. So if you can kind of liken it to f- what fast what what fast food is available, I think that makes it seem like yeah. I remember having beef tendon in in a noodle soup, uh, or mm. a, there's a Taiwanese restaurant, a Taiwanese restaurant that we went to or that we go to in Edmonton near Modest Meats uh, when we're in a pinch for lunch or something, and uh, they prepare uh, beef tripe, uh, beef tendon, and pork intestine all in the Taiwanese style. And and so sort of ex- being an explorer in 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 culinary ideas and eating eth- you know being excited to eat ethnic dishes um it made me think well what could we prepare what could we save. Once upon a time uh Kevin in in our from the wild uh, adventures uh, from the wild.ca a little video thing that we did we're exploring exploring wild foods kind of from a culinary aspect uh um so he he said you should save beef intestines because he had eaten uh, he'd eaten or or heard of a recipe I can't remember how it came about but uh, beef small intestine cleaned out but with a lot of fat on it could be grilled and make it into a nice munchy crunchy snack and I was like you're disgusting but I'll save it for you just so I can watch you eat huh. that and uh, and tease you a bit huh. but anyway he did he went through his thing he sauced it he 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 put it up on a grill. And uh, I was like, "There's no reason why this shouldn't be delicious." And then we ate it, to, ate this beef intestine together, and we're like, "My God, that if that's food, uh, then we'll never want for food again." No kidding. So this is the journey, man. Um, so we went from kind of a, a moose heart, moose tongue, and, and liver to uh, the kill f- the, the slaughterhouse. Um, I say we've been running since 2010, and we would we learned about the the butcher's tenderloin or the hanging tenderloin. The hanging tenderloin is like a connective piece of wildly grained muscle that hangs kind of behind, it's up against the spine behind the lungs or to the rear of the lungs and heart. And it it, uh, it connects to some white connective tissue that would be your diaphragm, um, your diaphragm sort of tendon or sheet tendon that helps the animal breathe. But anyway, that hanging tenderloin in butcher shops that I follow online was featured quite prominently because a, but- a hanger, hanging tenderloin, um, is a fantastic piece of meat uh, cooked to be eaten on its own, like sliced thin and grilled. It's delicious. Huh. Um, in the in in the in the world of of hunt of of hunting or, or harvesting wild game, or not that many, you might just use that red meat as part of your grind. Like you might include it into the ground, you know, your 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 ground bin. Um, but but I think it's a real treat to pull those out of the beef. Mm. And the diaphragms themselves, there's a strip of muscle, like an inside skirt or diaphragm from the inside of the body cavity. These sorts of red meat muscles that were that are that are definitely usable, um, and then we go we go further. And so recently, I'm excited about uh, saving the 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 call fat, which is the bag of fat surrounding the intestines in the intestinal cavity. Mm-hmm. Um, pure clean white fat, as well as the suet around the kidneys, that can be rendered and used as cooking, like as a cooking suet or cooking lard. That we've we've been using beef fat uh, to cook rather than seed oils for years now. Yeah. Um, 
So, so we get to fat, and then we get to tendons, and we get to things like pale, pails of blood is another little story, Trav. I don't know if your listeners want to hear about pails of blood, but I'm, I was introduced to pails of blood when I, I think we, I told you about that little story where I had to, um, or I was asked to kill some cows for a farm. Did I tell you that one? I think so. Yeah. But go ahead. This is entertaining. Okay. Fair enough. The, um, I'll, I'll condense it cause I'm pretty sure it's in our last episode, but, uh, uh, there I am. I got talked into going out the only white guy on this farm, Filipino farm. They're just starting out. They're getting animals from the auction. And, um, uh, previously they got goats and they had, uh, smaller animals. And this is the first time they had cows and these cows still had their horns. They didn't have them chopped and lied. And I had visions of, uh, just walking up and using a 22 close to the head and putting the thing down. But these were some, uh, already agitated cows that, uh, I, I couldn't get close to. And so, uh, took them from a distance, learned exactly where the shot placement is on a skull. Cause it's very different from the, uh, looking at a skull and looking at a live, uh, cow's head and trying to extrapolate. Totally. So, uh, 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 second cow, it went down on first shot. I can't say the first cow went down on first shot, but there was a learning experience there. But as soon as it's down, they would run over, they'd slit the throat and they're collecting all the blood into great big bowls and, and buckets. And they said, they're going to boil it up. And they said, it's like chocolate. It's so good. Do I want some? And I said, well, I really appreciate the offer. I think I might pass in hindsight, because I was in my early twenties there. In hindsight, I think I should have tried some. And at some point in my life, I'm yep. pretty sure I will. But why don't you tell me about this? Yep. Um, well, yeah, there's multi-use, uh, at the slaughterhouse. So, uh, there's a, like an Eastern European tradition and, and a British tradition, French tradition for making, uh, blood sausage, I guess. Like, so I think culinary uh, tradition, uh, yep. not just European and Asian. Yeah. So bl- uh, pork blood traditionally for, for blood sausage, um, uh, uh, I had never thought about the blood pudding, although there was a culinary friend in a cooking competition uh, prepared exactly that. I think it was like a blood a blood mousse, but flavored with cocoa. Mm. So it was the richness of cooked blood, but blended with cocoa and sugar to make a, a sweet blood custard, which is pretty huh. f- like that's pretty challenging for the, uh-huh. for the North American palate. But man, if that animal has to die, and you're and there, there are folks that want to or are, are are at least curious about exploring how you can use that for food. I think um, all power to them. Um, mm-hmm. Being the owner of a slaughterhouse, we have uh, an immense amount of uh, available blood, and we j- it just generally goes down the drain. Um, mm. And and we haven't thought about it for years, except for occasionally harvesting blood to sell to some restaurants for 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 blood sausage. But um, one of my daughters was in, I don't know, in uh, early high school, early bi- biology 10 or something like that. And they were, somehow the, 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 the topic came up, they were talking about the nutritional qualities of, of blood for soil and soil building. And so, of course, the slaughter daughters were, you know, were, at, were at work on a Friday and um, <laughs> uh, we wanted, she wanted to experiment. So I went to Home Depot and bought like 10 uh, orange Home Depot five-gallon pails because we didn't have any good ones kicking around. And we, we saved, we ended up with five, five gallon pails of beef blood that we saved and put in the back of the truck to take home, to add to our compost pile, huh. to, uh, to, to see what would happen. Because we noticed on the farm, if we've done any on-farm slaughters, uh, where, wherever blood is spilled, uh, the vegetation just jumps out of the ground. It's just electric. Uh, as soon as, uh, there's just so much nitrogen. And then the micronutrients mm. in blood also that are accumulated by, uh, by a mammal is exactly kind of what the root system needs in 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 almost all plants um to really to really grow <laughs> to really grow to put carbon dioxide in water to work and and build healthy root systems. So uh, on our compost pile we took 5 or 25 gallons of of beef blood and the pile heated up almost immediately there's like a whole bunch of weird things the blood clotted in the pail so it was like pouring out these this weird um red silk scarf it onto our lawn clipping pile, uh, five, five mm. gallon red silk scarfs in these kind of pieces of, of big bright red jello was swirling. Like you kind of get lost in it if you stare into a, a blood clot from a freshly killed animal. Huh. And then we turned it over in the grass and within a couple of hours, we went back and checked after supper the, and the pile was just steaming. So the microbiology in the pile of compost was also electrified to, to just sort of melt down <laughs> 
uh, it went into you know nuclear wow. meltdown mode with having all of that nutrition and and the water available it meant that um, the microbiome or whatever living in our compost pile I loved it and uh, that compost was used on a experimental food forest garden and the plants e- exactly what we expected would happen the plants are just jumping out of the soil so um, we, anyway it's just a huge contemplative thing we said. We used to think that to, to have an apple tree grow or to put in a perennial raspberries or something like that, we would dig down into our horrible uh, boreal forest soil. This used to be just a mixed wood boreal, but most of the farmland here is uh, an eighth of an inch of topsoil and then, and then clay where we live. Uh, there are spots, at low spots, where leaves have blown off the, uh, the poplar trees and accumulated over the years where, where the, the topsoil is a few centimeters, but not much more than that. So... Instead of digging down uh, to plant plants, we uh, sp- spoke with our, uh, our wine-growing friend in Summerland, BC, and that, that place is a desert. Mm-hmm. Uh, and their innovative ideas, the approach to viticulture, was build, build upwards instead of digging down. Let the plant dig down if it wants, but build, build your soils on top of the surface. So lay down carb- car- cardboard and, or mulch and then mulch on top of it and put your composts on, on top of that to, to, build, to build a new layer of soil. And um, and so the compost with blood in it was absolutely mental. And it's funny because it's October, I don't know, tenth. Yeah. Yeah. October tenth today. And um, of the the food forest experiment that, that that I did with my daughter Annika, um, we we were just out harvesting uh, the last of the strawberries from her food forest, and that is absolutely not normal for Alberta at this time of year. But uh, there's wow. heat coming out of the compost still. No kidding. So despite having, yeah, we've had a couple of heavy frosts, but because of the, the, the other, there's heat in the soil and her nasturtiums, I think, kind of blanketed the strawberries uh, with their foliage. So there are ripe strawberries that she's picking just today after kill. We stopped at the strawberry patch and picked some strawberries out of, out of the blood compost. So it's sort of like a, a weird full circle story about getting strawberries out of blood uh, because it activated the compost to, to, to throw off heat. You could stick your hands into the dirt in her food forest, this dirt on top of cardboard that we started in, in May, I think. Or we, we heaped up in May, and it's still hot. The soil is warm to the touch. Wow. Right, so that's a miracle of what's, what surrounds us. And then the story of a restaurant, a, custo- a customer of ours who we kill big fat beef for every week, Brad Jesperson, North Country Market, he said he's got a customer, a restaurant in Spruce Grove called Barbaco, and they want tendons. And we've saved tendons from beef before for dogs and dog food. Um, and that is the tendon in the back of the, the the back side of the lower the lower extremity of the limb above the hoof. So if if my hand is the hoof, we are taking this heavy tendon out of out of this part of the animal's lower leg. If you skin the hide off back here, you can take a great big and then cut with your knife into the tendon and all the way down to the to the first elbow. Um, you could take quite a heap, uh, one one single white cable, and it's not meat and it's not fat, it's tendon. Mm. And Barbacoa Restaurant wanted for human consumption. Well, we're familiar with doing this for dogs, and they're always really mucky, and they they go in a pile on the floor in the gut room. And then uh, we'd take them home to the farm smoker, which is a plywood box with a smoke generator. And I'd smoke them, and we'd sell them f- in the city for, for dog treats. But that wasn't going to cut it for, for human grade. So um, with the animal on its back in a cradle, and this, you could do this with your wild game as well, to take tendons for either your pets or for deer tendon, elk tendon, um, or a moose tendon soup. And it's something worth exploring. And And, and like... I don't think I think tendon was a lot more approachable than liver, kidney, or, or maybe even heart, um, because when you braise a tendon, you just sort of end up with a chewy noodle, and a, and a broth that has a ton of collagen in it. So even if you strain out the solids after you boil tendon in 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 a water or a, a stock, so salted water, maybe flavored with with um, oxo cubes or your own stock, like a veggie stock or a beef beef stock, if you boil the bejesus out of a tendon. Um, and then let that cool, strain out the solids, and then that, let that cool. You'll have what we call it at, at our house, brown jello, which is a, a re, like a high collagen, high elastin, um, cooled substrate that melts in a pan and can be added to, to add like a velvety and uh, a velvety mouthfeel to any, any dish at all. Um, they would be some, have somewhat of a liquid component. So your chilies, your soups, uh, like, like any, any soup or chili, any stew or curry, all benefits from our brown jello. 
and that really is just boiled down or boiled down and broken down uh, uh, tendon, beef tendon in our house. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. To, to take it a step further on the tendon tendon chat, um, uh, culinary masters, so these chefs at this restaurant, um, they would take the tendon dish a few steps further, and that was you braise the tendon, you slice it really thin, and you let it dry out on a wire rack. And then once it's dry, you can deep fry it and make mm. um, uh, chicharrones or something that would re- would resemble uh, to like a person who just eats fast food and uh, at the at the gas station uh, like pork rinds. So the beef tendons braised, braised or boiled, sliced thin, dried, and then put into deep like to hot hot oil, and they puff up into something crunchy like a pork rind, which would be a chicharrone if it was pork. But so it's just a beef, a beef crisp made out of those tendons. And they really take on the flavor of whatever you add to them. So you throw some salt and pepper, garlic salt on them. They're just a nice, crunchy, totally different texture from anything else that you can get from a beef, but quite pleasant and no strong flavor or anything. And then as, as, as far as health goes, um, um, just loaded with elastin and collagen, which features highly in a lot of prominent mm. beauty products for, and, and skin, skin re- re- regeneration stuff. Yeah. That's why I look so young. <laughs> I'm a, I'm 110. I, I would think that eating that would probably be better than just rubbing it on the face, like in the products. But hey, that's you know, teach your own. When you work on the kill floor, you get a little bit of both. You know what I mean? <laughs> Have you ever had um, moose nose? Because I a friend of mine uh, just sent me up a picture. It was a little pretty sad photo, but it was uh, uh, a cow moose that was killed just for its nose and he's a conservation officer. So they're tracking down the people who did this. Um, but he was talking about what a delicacy it is in some cultures. Um, I can't say I've ever had moose nose. Have you tried that? You know, surprisingly, no, uh, we've done a lot of weird things, uh, but we haven't had a moose dead in a few years. And I think that now I have the culinary, like, Mm. I have the culinary skills, like, and the confidence to say that I think that I could, I could approach a moose nose now, um, after exploring like chicken feet and oxtail and, 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 and the tendons, I, I think that you could get something that like, that would be approachable for anybody. So I think that you don't have to be as brave as you think in order to eat something like that. Um, mm. but no, I haven't had moose nose yet. I think it's a tragedy. Like, isn't that an interesting topic? Like to say that as Westerners, we kill an animal for its tenderloin and then secondarily mm-hmm. rib steaks and strip loins. But a lot of the animal is ground, mm-hmm. made into Slim Jims or like, like pepperoni. And then so much of it is thrown away, like the heart, the nose, the tendons, the tail, mm-hmm. and the livers and kidneys mm-hmm. and like fat and all that stuff is just thrown into the garbage, just the hide also. Um, and then you kind of flip it upside down and you say, imagine someone thinking it was a good idea to harvest an animal just for its nose. Um, it's awful. And it contravenes, of course, that contravenes all, uh, you know, fish and wildlife le- legislation and sure. protection of wildlife, all that stuff. Um, so that makes me sad. But uh, it is just an interesting, that's an interesting little um, s- news snippet. And I, that's why I brought it up, not, not to be political because it's so easy to take that into the political spectrum and it's a, it's an unfortunate event that, uh, and they're working hard at putting an end to and through knowledge and, you know, everybody out there talking and eyes open and realizing that there's a community to be accountable to just talking about this sort of thing can, can help with ensuring that people are, are not wasting animals when well, that would, in my opinion, that's a massive waste right there. I think everyone's opinion would say the same thing, but you know, there's things that people don't consider wasting that maybe with a little bit more of education, like what you're talking about here, uh, they will in the future and they'll find ways to be able to cook up these odd bits and these um, air bracks again, waste parts in a way that just really utilizes a whole animal tip to tail. I think that there are cultures that aren't nearly as uh, well off as as uh, Western Canadian or Canadians and and the West uh, that, mm. that that such that well one that they may have a deeper connection with animals and and or wildlife to begin with uh, with their food sources with their food traditions and and so eliminating waste for both financial reasons uh, and also um, like traditional. Asian medicine, traditional, you know, like uh, a, a medical food through, me- or sorry, medicine through food. 
uh, in a culture that's a lot older than Western European culture, where they're saying that there is uh, value in eating peculiar bits, you know, to you and I uh, maybe, uh, to sort of help settle ailments in, in a time before uh, Centrum multivitamin w was available, in a time before you get tidy little caplets of omega-3 and omega-6 mm. to help your your thinning hair or your sore joints. Um, so I think that there's there's thousand year tra you know f uh, food as medicine thousand multi thousands of year uh, cultural heritage in 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 cultures older than Western European uh, where they had to figure out or they got to figure out wow well, why that's an interesting idea too like you know <laughs> which which plants in the forest in the are there for my bed to to solve which you know to help aid in what um, what ailments. And then which parts of the animal can aid me mm -hmm. similarly? There's definitely a deeper connection with the, your natural environment and what you're eating. If you're able to pick up on these little bits and what they're actually doing for you. And I guess a good connection with yourself, if you're in tune enough to realize that when I eat this, it makes this happen. So it's a pretty deep magic trip. Yeah. Yeah, totally. I agree. It's, uh, when you're talking about the, uh, uh, blood in the grass and everything growing up just reminds me of full metal jacket. What makes the grass grow? Blood, 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 right? Uh, I always thought that was just something that they chanted and it was for shock effect, but turns out, yeah, it, it does. Uh, another experiment that we did in the house was that, uh, if, you know, the, 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 the question I had to ask is what if, what if beef tripe, that is stomach is food? And if we could make beef tripe or stomach food for people, that is food for food for people, mm -hmm. um, then that blows the doors off all kinds of weird ideas about scarcity. And uh, mm. like, I couldn't believe that we could eat well as a family of six really off. Our joke is in the early years, we really were working for the banks more than, than, than working for a paycheck. We were working just to pay all the people that allowed us to have this slaughterhouse business in the first place. And, um, and with us having a bunch of kids back to back to back, uh, we called it bin food for dinner tonight. That what what we got to eat would be what was in the bin, what would have been thrown out on kill day, or what would mm. have been trimmed to throw out from the from the cut floor. So, uh, when a farmer brings in an animal, mm. we ask for a cut instruction. How do you want each muscle group cut? Uh, what thickness for steaks? What size of roasts? And do you want your heart, tongue, liver, kidney, suet, tail, cheeks? Um, and they, and a lot of those cut instructions, the most of them are no, 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 no. So those things would be saved on the kill floor, but then they, 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 would, they would go into the cooler as like approved uh, because there's a meat inspector there. So they're human approved organs and offal, but the, generally uh, most farmers wouldn't take those unless they had a dog, a farm dog or something like that. They could, but a lot of them just, mm. no. So our family learned to eat offal out of necessity and thriftiness. Um, and then we've, mm -hmm. we've come a long way since then to like, like actually preferring certain cuts or certain offal like hangers or diaphragm skirt. Um, and then also mm -hmm. kind of wor working into the explore, exploring things like tendons and what's the use of blood on the farm. But there's just such a huge volume of it, um, that it, it's hard to just walk away from a dumpster where, where you're putting 50 to 80 pounds of beef fat per animal into the garbage and uh, mm. I went on this kick where I, I couldn't sleep for, for two days because I was thinking about the caloric value of, of that fat. And Google told me or the internet told me it's, it's very close to the, that of diesel fuel. So I thought, can't we, can we refine this animal fat uh, through not that complex a chemi chemical process with a backyard biodiesel uh, generation system? Mm -hmm. Can we make biodiesel? And mainly it would just be funny and fun to run my truck on animal fat just like if, if I did it once, I would have been pleased with myself and I could die happy. But uh, we didn't get to that stage um, because the first step for uh, suet or beef fat is to, to render it and render out the, um, the connective tissue and the impurities uh, bits, which uh, every farm family kind of has experience with that during, after a pig slaughter or, or even an on-farm beef slaughter. Uh, the fat goes into the oven in a gigantic pot or onto the stove at low, low temperature. And then overnight it'll melt down, and then we'll ladle off the the clear the clarified fat into mason jars on the counter and let them cool into mm -hmm. hard lard or hard suet to be used in cooking or for pies later on in the year. Um, and then the 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 nibbly bits usually someone who's disgusting will go and eat those nibbly bits like schmaltz or uh, 
Well, there was another word about mm-hmm. schmaltz, <laughs> the bits that are left over. That's the connective tissue that's sort of been fried or yep. feet id in that in that fat, that animal fat, and it's quite crunchy and good. So if you've just been out freezing your nuts off in a, in a deer stand and you come home and there's some fat rendering in, in the oven or on the stovetop, you grab those little fat connective tissue bits and eat those. But but the rendered lard, mm. my point is the rendered lard is the first step to biodiesel. <laughs> Once you have this clarified, the clarified lard or clarified suet in jars or in a pail or in a 55-gallon drum, uh, that's step one. And uh, what happened here, I think two weeks ago, is uh, a, a restaurant customer said, I'd like to switch back for, uh, where once upon a time, French fries and fish and chips were predominantly fried in beef fat or beef tallow. And McDonald's mm-hmm. restaurants, uh, once when they were founded, it was fairly well known that they cooked all their French fries in beef tallow. And that was part of what made their fries notoriously delicious, as they were fried in beef tallow instead mm-hmm. of... Uh, they eventually switched for cost reasons. I read the history of this um, into seed oils like canola oil is, but canola oil with additives um, that made the canola oil taste or behave more like beef fat. Yeah, not the same. So there's a brewing company in Edmonton, and uh, they have a tasting room. And they said, "Hey, listen, can you render me some fat for our deep fryers because we like to provide chip uh, like potato chips and also French fries to our customers while they're tasting our beer." And um, so Brad with the fat cattle and I kind of said, well, sure, how, man, how much fat do you need? Like we thought a few liters. We need about 200 liters a week. And we we're like, yeah, that's, that's a whole business unto itself. And so this enters into, <laughs> I said, so Brad's got the cattle, we're killing them for him. And he's like, can you save me this fat? And I'm like, 200 liters is like, it's four, it starts out as 400 pounds of fat. And we are throwing out 400 pounds of fat a week and then some from his animals. So like this is all doable. But we need a separate building to do this because we don't have enough floor space and room to save 400 pounds of animal fat. Uh, we need a gigantic steam kettle to melt this down to render it in, in monstrous batches, like two, 300 liters at a time. So I'm kind of doing research on all this equipment and I'm kind of fooling around on realtor.ca uh, to look at like land mm. and buildings or whatever available. And uh, this is where, this is fun. We talked about this off air a little bit, but uh, uh, the United Church in Sanguno is for sale for a low, low price. And I'm like, that's weird. And uh, so I'm hanging out with one of the slaughter daughters. We're driving to Vancouver. It's a long story. But uh, we had 15 hours to kill. Not to see you. We were delivering some cats, if you can believe. She's a real catrepreneur also, so we were delivering some kittens <laughs> to Vancouver. League. It was all legal. Yep. It was all legal. It's how she's paying herself, paying her way through university. And, Next uh, time, drop by. And I was like, you, yeah, we definitely will. Actually, like, I was like, who can we call? We were there for. I was there for one night, and I had to fly back to. She dropped me off at the airport. I just wanted to be there through the mountains because I'm like, I, I could never forgive myself if you had a wreck or something or, or just a breakdown, with your kittens in the back. So we, I drove there and then flew home, and then Heather, my wife, flew, flew there and drove home with with Anna on the way back. It was really funny. But um, anyway, <laughs> lost my cats, catrepreneur. Uh, oh, so, so we had 15 hours to kill and we're talking about this church for sale. And I said, it's 4,000 square feet of space and it's, it's like a block away from the meatpacking plant. And so we started singing a jingle about sauce church. <laughs> we're going to make a church that makes sauces as well as rendered fat. But rendered fat, we need a place with a giant kettle a giant, like a commercial sized kettle, they build these all the time on cruise ships and convention centers where they would make two to 500 liters of a soup at a time. Um, the aftermarket world has them available. They're not that valuable. They're really expensive, I think, to buy new, but they're, nobody makes 200 liters of much. Um, so we approached our local investment community and we're sort of tied in there, a, a cooperative that we built uh, to finance the slaughterhouse. 14 years ago, and the the board of directors of our investment co-op was like super keen. They're like, yeah, we were worried that if that church like was sold as a residence, it would turn into a weird, like it just would mm. go to no good, no the good cult. use in the community. It wouldn't benefit. Yeah, yeah some cult <laughs> would move in, uh, you know, or it becomes some kind of a, a drug house, like, because it is a, it's an unusual building. Mm. It'd be weird to live there, I think. Mm-hmm. Uh, the kids and I both feel like there's probably some weird vibes that you wouldn't want to be there late at night, you know? <laughs> One of those places. 
Yeah, well, it's a, I don't know. We're, we're not a church-going family, and it has a peculiar feeling. I mean, like, kind of quite a nice feeling upstairs, and then the basement is, like, definitely haunted. A little, I don't know. A little smudging, and then it's a house of the Lord. House of the Lord. I think so. <laughs> the United Church, yeah, it's house of Lord, praise the Lord. That's right. That's the, that's the joke, without <laughs> offending the church people. But the, the United Church had a ceremony where they, they like, decommissioned the church, and one of the members of the of the church said that they actually make it. Uh, there's a special word, but they they desanctified the church, so now it's just a civilian building again. Mm. And it's like I appreciate that. That's great because less ghosts, <laughs> less, less ghosts, ghosts is good. the better. Yes, I yeah. agree. Especially in your lard, in your lard production. You don't business. want so, ghosts in your lard. So we believe. Yeah, this is the next project, Travis. Uh, you can get in on the ground floor opportunity. Uh, these shares are going to go wild <laughs> at, in the Sanguda Stock Exchange get on the IPO. <laughs> Yeah, you can, it's the, I call it the ILO, the initial local offering. (laughs) We're reinventing finance and Sangudo. Sangudo. That's how desperate we are to not cease to exist as a town. Oh, I'm sold. I'm totally sold. You just sold me right there. Church basement, lard, praise the lard, uh, sauce church. So, so this is it. So this is, I think, possibly the best business decision ever. Not the slaughterhouse, no. Not the retail meat shop in Edmonton, also no. Low margin, uh, high uh, spoilage, mm-hmm. or not spoilage, but uh, low, like short shelf life. But I think my entire life, the last 14 years, has been devoted to the meats. And I was like, kept looking in my, my waste trailer, the garbage, the dumping mm. trailer at the dump, just thinking we could do better. Yep. We could do so much better. When we connected with a compost guy, I'm like, now we're making dirt. Mm-hmm. And then when we threw blood on the compost, I'm like, now we're making compost. And these plants are loving animal juices on their roots. And like, so that's really smart. But still the fat could, we, you know, so, so we just, we, we, we didn't have to continue to process this stuff into biodiesel if we can sell it for the world, the world of French fries. And if it's true, the case that one French, one brewery that wants to sell French fries needs something like, 200 liters a week, and even if they're off by a factor of 10, or if I'm telling this mm. story like a moron and it was 20 liters, well, then to get to 200 is only 10 restaurants. So our puny little slaughterhouse that kills mm. 20 beef a week could take the fat from the animals and, uh, and, and, and extra, extra bones. That was Sauce Church will manufacture rendered lard for, for deep fryers in Edmonton, as many as we can uh, fill, and and then also the steam kettle can be used to do bone broth, which is a restorative, nutritious uh, superfood. Uh, friends of ours, super sad story. Um, recently had a baby, and the mother was diagnosed with a a tumor that was cancerous in her brain, and they removed it, and she's undergoing chemo. But um, they've she's been devoutly uh, making bone broth for herself as just a superfood to to just get, to get through the chemo. Uh, mm-hmm. To give her food all, or give her body all of the micronutrients that it needs, she's been really keen on 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 bone broth, and have has developed some recipes that really work for them. Um, we have our house recipes at our house for bone broth, uh, building beef stock yeah. where you where you start with bones and four days later you end up with uh, again kind of a brown jello or with a lot of super nutrients, yeah. nutrient dense stuff. And I thought, man, if if we have the floor space. Uh, via this decommissioned church building, um, we get so so. If things work out, financing comes off on the fifteenth in five days, and then possession is November first. Um, it's got a small kitchen in the basement, and we can get it AHS approved. I don't think with too many modifications to be able to turn this into a whole. So my late the latest business venture is uh, making use of waste exclusively, making use of waste. I, I think that's brilliant. Like I, that's absolutely brilliant. I think you've got a m- very large market. The shelf life of this stuff when frozen is going to be pretty good. And you've got a sweet backstory as well of where it's coming from and everything that went into it that I think people would want to get behind. I think it's a really smart business venture, honestly. I appreciate it. It it comes from a desire to to really honor, to, to not throw the animal away. Or to, to th- like we... By weight, if an animal comes in at 1,800 pounds, it hangs 850 pounds. So the hide, mm-hmm. head, blood, and guts are, are half the weight. And then when it, when it shows up on the it, – it, it hangs in the aging coolers for a couple of weeks, and it's down another 6 or 8%. Um, and then it goes through the cut room, and uh, trim steaks and trim roasts, probably, probably looking at a 65% yield 
on 50% of the live weight. So the animal, most of the animal that we eat is discarded. Mm -hmm. And so when my kids, when we put a steak on one of the, we're having family dinner and we have T-bones or something really gratuitous. Everyone gets a two pound T-bone on their plate mm. and the kids like cut away the fat. Yeah. I say, give me that. Yeah. <laughs> and I eat it. <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. That's what the flavor is. <laughs> because, yeah. But, but also like, I, I just can't, and that's, I have a body uh, fit, you know, that matches, but uh I, I can't stand that there would be waste at sort of the restaurant level or at the kitchen. So there's also waste at the kitchen table. Mm. So half the animals throw it out when you kill it, kill it, and then half again when you cut it and pack it and wrap it. And then you throw it. Then someone like doesn't feel like finishing their steak and it goes in the garbage. It goes to the dog after that. And that's frustrating because yeah, that, that animal, like, like it was, yeah, someone, <sighs> someone fought for that animal. If it's in the case of a domestic animal, someone fought to keep that thing alive. Uh, for two years before it went to slaughter, or in the wild, like you know, the the animals born and survived like kind of some insurmountable odds uh, for a, mm -hmm. a young uh, newborn animal to make it to adulthood to then be harvested. It's tough to then have it thrown out many times in a row. Mm -hmm. You know, teaching people that, and I think the easiest way to do that is to start with those you know, their friends and family. Uh, we worked hard with our kids from a very young age to eat every part of the animal as much as we were comfortable and knowledgeable to cook up. Luckily, like I love eating, so that's not a problem. And my wife's a Red Seal chef by trade, so she loves cooking. So that's a good, good fix there. Good mix. And, uh, but you know, our, like our Christmas traditions, we'll have blood puddings, blood sausages. Uh, that's something everyone looks forward to and we'll have it a few times throughout the year, not all the time. Haggis, of course, Robbie Burns day. Everyone loves haggis. Not, not if it's too livery, uh, oxtail. I mean, put that in the, um, in the pressure cooker and that's the best way that I found that uh, I really enjoy it. But you know, we brought our kids to a friend's place at a very young age and they got to meet the, uh, the Berkshire pig that we were going to be taken home all wrapped up. So they, I, brought them around the corner for when it was shot. Cause I didn't, you know, they're pretty young and probably don't, it doesn't always go as anticipated when it's shot. You don't know if it's going to be a quick and or not, but hopefully the person knows what they're doing and they do it right. And it, it does go as anticipated. This one did, but, uh, aside from the shot, they were there prior to the shot, um, around the corner was shot and then drag it out and butchering it up and letting it hang and then working on it. They're all a part of the process there. And I think that really helps them and just have that appreciation for what the food was. It doesn't just come wrapped up in cellophane at the grocery store, what it was before, where it is now. And we've never had that issue with them being picky eaters, thankfully. Yeah. I, you know, as a, as a lifetime hunter and then, and then as a professional, you know, meat harvester, I, I agree or couldn't agree more with you about how important it is for, to get youngsters out and people of all, of all walks of life, uh, to be involved with the harvesting of food and knowing, uh, knowing intimately where food comes from. I think that our culture is like, it's okay with having a TV shows, um, that, uh, that broach, you know, like s savage, <laughs> savage level, horrible content. Mm. And like, that's, it's, it's, I don't, I don't know. It, it's a, it's allowed or maybe encouraged. You can turn on CSI Miami anytime, seven o'clock at night. And they're exploring subjects fictitiously. That's true. Mm -hmm. There's actors and the kids understand that, but uh, really mature subject matter about what humans do to humans. And in a fictitious way, and I find it quite appalling. <laughs> like yeah. they're approaching matters that are challenging from myself and I'm a murderer, but the things that humans do to humans. And then in real life, if you actually turn on the news, probably more appalling than a lot of the fictional mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, documentaries and things. Uh, the news is pretty shocking too, about what humans do to humans. Um, so I think that takes a, maybe a bigger leap, uh, even for kids or for people from uh, main, main, more, more mainstream walks of life. Then, than digest, digesting the concept of harvesting an animal to eat. Even people that, say, came to Kevin Costa once from the wild on trips where they had worked in food, they had served food, they had prepared food, uh, but they had never harvested an animal before. 
while it was emotional and spiritual and a journey for each each person that we introduced to catching a fish, killing a fish, bleeding a fish, uh, uh, shooting a grouse, uh, harvesting a grouse, processing a grouse, uh, and then all the way up to deer and and bear, black mm-hmm. bears. Uh, I think that it was an easier transition than you than you'd think. Um, for people to not, not I mean, to, to just appreciate where food comes from. And I think that a lot of people that have that experience, they kind of, they maybe might choose to not go back to eating food that's just on a styrofoam tray or never buy food or meat on a styrofoam tray without without th- having some deeper thoughts about h- how many hands touched that before it got here and why is it on sale? Yeah. <laughs> and those are good questions to ask. Those are good questions to ask. You know, the, the other thing I... I uh, really wanted to impress upon my kids at an early age was just that whole concept of life and death, because it brings a greater appreciation for life in general. And I think that death is such a closed door activity nowadays. You don't see open caskets that much anymore. Uh, all, it's a very sanitary process in behind closed doors when you find your food coming out to you that there's, I think there's a disconnect in general society of, of life and death. And then you couple that with, you know, media, like you're talking about watching your CSI or playing the video games and life is just given such a very low value that I think it, um, it gives the wrong impression to people that, uh, go back a hundred years, there is a very different relationship between the living and the dead, whether that's animals and people and having that connection, I think, makes you a better person. Yeah, I think I'm yeah, more contemplative and probably uh, a person who would be more uh, living in the moment and 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 more grateful and humble. Uh, being the the trigger puller on this at the slaughterhouse has made me realize just how how a quarter of an inch of skull is between me and instant death. Uh, we ha- in uh, thirteen and a half years, mm-hmm. I've had two. Uh, firearms mishaps, uh, one where a gun went off and I caught some ricochet in my forearm off a, off a 22 long rifle and that didn't feel great. And a tiny piece of it hit me in this, in my, no- in my nostril and blood was coming out of my nose. So it was shocking. Uh, it was a bit of a wake up call. And then a mm. couple of weeks ago, um, I made bad choices and I used a 22 Magnum to shoot a lamb and the bullet went through the ram's head mm the inspector was kind of in a hurry. We we're all that I was in a hurry and trying to, uh, satisfy the inspector's need to get to a hockey practice or something. So I was like, while team a was working, the slaughter daughters were working on a beef that I, that would knock down and we put in the cradle, they were skinning it. I said, because we want to, we want to kind of get done quickly. I'll go and shoot the lamb out in the pens on a concrete floor and then drag it in. I'll work on the lamb while the kids are working on this beef. So anyway, I, and I didn't switch to 22 shorts. I just used the 22 Magnum. I'm like, it'll be extra dead. What could go wrong? Like, I hadn't had a mishap in a while. And this is like workplace safety. All these no-nos, all these contributing factors. But mm. uh, anyway, so I shot through the, the bullet went through the, ra- the lamb's head, bounced off the concrete, bounced off a pipe. And this, this little piece of 22 Magnum hit me like just on the right side of my temple a- at the speed of like someone just threw a Jeez. pebble at you. Like, so I just felt this little twink off my, my forehead. And then I kind of looked, I was looking at the floor and I, I saw the sparkle of copper and lead and it, it landed and it made a tink when it landed on the cement next to the dead lamb. And I was like, Oh, like there's mm. no one there to even see it. Like the kids were busy. The inspector was busy. And I was like, Oh man, that was like death himself just came and gave me a little, Oh, where's the, where's the camera? A little doink. And uh, I was like, Jesus, like that's how close <laughs> You are to shooting yourself, like so. Firearm safety was like, like, like brought back to the forefront, mm-hmm. and also that that lamb is dead, and it could have been, it could have been just as easily myself. So, anyway, the, the farm life we found. I thought this other idea is that my wife and I uh, moved out of the city, uh, didn't grow up on a farm, had no idea how farms work, and then twenty years ago we had our first daughter, and we're in Calgary, working downtown, and I'm like, this is stupid. This is what this is what you would do. Well, if you weren't me, I just couldn't believe that we could live like that. Uh, the commute, like gridlock, mm-hmm. uh, the C train, there were like all these instances of things where I thought that we'd lost our humanity. And I thought, I just don't want to raise, or we, d- we thought, we don't want to raise kids this way. Let's move to a farm. So we, we moved to the farm and 
uh, like you said, it was kind of like traveling back in time. So it's like, welcome to 1910. Don't mm -hmm. dive scurvy. Don't get dysentery. But th th we're way more clear and present in our daily lives of uh, how fragile human life is, how fragile we are dependent on uh, systems like water, not freezing, uh, electricity. When, when the grid goes down out here, there's not a huge rush for people to fix it. Snow shoveling, ice storms, heavy rain, flooding, all that stuff. So you kind of have to learn to battle those things uh, on your own. And then this year, uh, near to us, uh, there were wildfires that were crazy. So as a hunter, you can recognize why while, while a bad, uh, an unusually hot, dry summer, hot, dry spring might result in wildfires, you know it because of the crunch under your boots. If you put a lot, if you spend a lot of time in nature, you can recognize things that lead up to. Mm -hmm. Like a weird sum, a weird summer of wildfires, or weird a weird summer where the roads that you used to walk in on or drive in on are now muskeg bogs. So people that recreate outdoors can mm. kind of have a better appreciation of nature and natural things, and also animals and food and where they come from. Um, so we've had twenty years living as these druids out on our land, watching s some summers the, the 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 farmland would get so dry that it would crack, the the clay would crack and then open up, and there'd be these two inch cracks like running. We'd follow them, like with the mm. our little the slaughter daughters when they were under ten. There's <laughs> like, where does this crack go? Maybe to <laughs> Narnia or the underworld. I would tell them, you know, but the the myths and our and the relationship yep. with nature. I'm reading a book right now that's really got me bothered. Um, it's called The Age of Insecurity, and it's kind of, but the the author starts with a discussion about the uh, the Enclosures Act that kind of led led to. Um, this is, I don't know, I'm not trying to get political, but to Western uh, corporatism, Western uh, capitalism. So once upon a time, humans lived on land without the concept of ownership of land, and people just took what they needed and they lived off the land. And then these smart guys were like, hey, if we put a fence around that and said that one of us owns it, and then we throw off the people, then we can charge them to get what they need. They, like, they need that land for life, uh, to satisfy food, shelter, clothing. But if we take it away from them, put a fence around it, and then sell, we can sell the requirements of life back to them. It'll be hilarious. And it was probably a joke. Or like, there's no way anyone's going to respect a fence or believe that because I have a piece of paper that says that I own that land and you can't go in there anymore, then, then I'll, I'll grow the crop and sell it to you. Or I'll, <laughs> now you can work for me. <laughs> anyway, really interesting, the Enclosures Act and how it all started by making people yeah, no insecure. Kidding. You're food insecure. Well, I think that like, if you participate in uh, corporate capitalism to the extent that Heather and I did, that you have enough money to buy a bit of land, I would say that how do you invent a movement called the non or the unenclosures act, where where individuals leave their corporate jobs and buy an inexpensive bit of land, and then they're reconnected with the ability to provide for their basic needs directly where the magic of the sun meets the soil where food leaps out of the ground mm. and, and where the animals then eat those plants and create a fungus in their poops. And, and now you're eating mushrooms yeah. and you're eating plants and, and you're eating the animals. Like, how do you get back to where... Um, I think that our environmental woes and challenges would probably be a lot smaller if there was a person on every quarter section and a pig in every yard. And that's like my, that's my political campaign when I'm running for mayor of... South San Gudo, the town of 300. Yep. Is just, I think that probably... I can get behind that. The only way... Yeah, the only way we're going to have sort of a um, habitable future is if fewer people are worried about what sneakers they're wearing and what chains they got on and what symbols on the front of their car. And more people are just walking in boots or bare feet in the mud and appreciating like, hey, wait a minute, this is a bad grasshopper year. You know, beef prices are going to go up. I should probably grow my own beef. I think with, and then with Wi-Fi and things, like with technology, like what we're doing right here, um, and then COVID was another kind of uh, score for remote work uh, that you can, you can be an intellectual person doing intellectual work remotely from home, but why oughtn't you live on land where you can provide for a lot of the things, and in a shorter uh, distribution chain, you can provide for a lot of things that you need in a local, in a local small community. But, but I think that it comes from like what, and, and this is just, to, I'm just rambling on your point in that uh, can you make a more decent kid or a decent uh, citizen if they've been around 
not like traditional farm life. I don't want to go back to where how we how it was. Um, there are a lot of improvements that have made since then, but I think taking modern uh, contemporary society and then asking that they become more involved in the wild places and in in d with a direct connection to land itself, um, such that the, the land is managed better. And and I think that probably like the the, the tip of the spear might be exactly your people. And that, uh, that is the hunters and wildlife conservation f folks. Um, those are the people that are, maybe they, li they live in, uh, uh, in, in urban in s settings. But I think the people that really uh, consistently spend money to, to conserve wildlife and think, about, think big thoughts about nature are, are, are probably the people that use nature. I had a few other things I wanted to touch on, but I also have some questions here from the Silver Court Club, oh, yeah. people through social cool. media. And they got some good ones in here. They got some really silly ones, which I'm not even going to bother getting into because I, I just don't even understand it. But, um, uh, okay. some of the good questions we had, let's say field dressing in your opinion, what's the best field dressing utensil? Oh man, I love it. This is really intimate and interactive, Travis. I really feel great about these sorts of questions. And I could, like, as you know, I can go on any topic for hours with enough coffee uh, the best field dressing utensil, utensil is probably uh, a round honing steel that is inexpensive and bought from a butcher supply company, 12-inch uh, Victorinox black-handled honing steel, and knowing how to use it for an inexpensive uh, butcher knife, like a, a boning knife, 6-inch stiff. 6-inch boning knife, stiff, straight back, Yep. And a honing steel are so key that if you have a razor sharp knife that is at least six inches long, you can core the butthole on your animal up to and including a moose or elk or large, like the largest of the large game. Um, if it's razor sharp, you're not pulling or pushing the, on the knife in a way that would create a dangerous situation for you stabbing yourself and bleeding out because you're field dressing in, in a remote area. So that's it. Just if you have a people, they, there's all this stupid, um, expensive kit that is sold with various camouflage patterns and sold under various stupid brand names that make it sound super extreme, mega, and they're all n unnecessary. A boning knife for 20... I think retail you can buy a six-inch boning knife with a big plastic handle that is ergonomically useful for about 30 bucks, and then a honing steel is... Uh, a honing steel or honing rod... Um, is about a hundred, but those two pieces of kit are unbelievably useful, uh, in the field. I find I don't carry a saw to cut the brisket. It's just unnecessary. Uh, as you get advanced, you can actually split the brisket on any animal, including a moose, um, through the cartilage beside the center sternum bone, if you want to get fancy or just reach up, up to your, just roll your sleeves up and you don't mm. have to split the sternum and create a sharp edge. And then this, like, so just a sharp knife is very, very important. And then the, the second, the really cool piece of kit that is like, would be a sleeper for most people. And you probably, you wouldn't even see them at a hunting store. It would be a ratchet strap. The, the value of a ratchet strap in your kit for field dressing is next level. And <laughs> I'll fight anyone who wants to say that there's a better <laughs> piece of kit. So you could learn how to tie a knot and, and actually your rat, replace your ratchet strap with a lighter piece of gear, which would be like a quarter inch piece, a quarter inch nylon rope and like 10 feet of it. But a 10 foot ratchet strap for those of us who give zero shits about learning how to tie knots means that you can go around the back leg of the animal and you can go over to a tree or, or to your buddy, but to a tree when you don't have friends or you're hunting solo or the animal's down and you're, your hunting partners are far away. Um, you can ratchet strap to a tree and so you can crank uh, in a way that's stronger than just you. You kind of can, can get a competitive advantage through ratchet strap, that nylon webbing slides really nice. So you can go to the animal, mm. like through its uh, the tendon and the back leg, around a tree, back through the leg, back to the tree, back through the leg, like on a moose. And now you have like four times mechanical advantage mm -hmm. because of the pulleys. And that stuff slides better than rope around a tree, that nylon stuff. So then you can, you can pull the, the animal over with a ratchet strap so one guy, a ratchet strap and a sharp knife is a great way to manage even the biggest of, of downed wild game. That's my, that's my answer. Love it. <laughs> What's 
the best way to avoid getting hairy meat? Oh man, that's a great question. Uh, the best way to avoid getting hair on, on your wild game meat is to minimize the number of times that you penetrate the hide with the knife during gutting and then subsequent processing. So minimize the number of holes in the hide. And I did a course once, or workshop once upon a time, um, where you would dress the animal differently depending on which equipment that you had with you. So if you're road hunting and the animal is dead near your truck, um, you could be more aggressive in how much processing you do compared with if you're backpacking in and you have an animal down 16 miles from the nearest road or vehicle. But one of the methods I speak about in my workshop that is, I wish it was available online. Maybe we'll, we'll, we'll video on one day, uh, you and Tiffany and, and I, Travis. But uh, a minimal intrusion gutting method is the best way to minimize the number of punctures and the length of those punctures through the hide. Uh, and it would be the method that I would choose to gut an animal if I had to haul it a long ways uh, to get back to a vehicle. And then once, so minimum intrusion is uh, core the butthole and around the genitals. So cut the, the tailpipe in a circle, giant donut around the ass. And if it's a female, uh, the vulva area. And then a small slash uh, in the abdomen, like six inches or less in the belly, right beside the penis or where the teats are on a female, like on a doe, like between the nipple, like uh, longitudinally, but a six inch gash between the nipples on a doe or cow, cow elk or cow moose. And then the third slash is just at the throat. So through those very small intrusions, you can loosen the throat and the esophagus by punching your arm down around the collarbones and loosening it all just through that little hole in the neck. And then you can, you can core out the butthole and then reach in through the, the, the slash in the, in the guts area and grab the tailpipe and pull it out that, that small cut and then reach your arms up through the small cut in the belly and open the diaphragm to pull the heart and lungs out that way. And th so the, the, you're making the least amount of like inches of cutting through hide and hair as possible with just a butthole core, a throat slash, and then a small incision in the belly. You're going to want to roll up, like take off your long sleeve shirt and, and roll up your sleeves in a larger animal to get up and, and, and reach up through the diaphragm, cut the diaphragm, and pull the throat and trachea out through that same incision in the belly. Um, it's all doable. But the goal is there's no perfection. Mm. Like, oh, Jeff said you can only do six inches cut in the belly. If you have to make it longer, then make it longer, But uh, especially for a bigger animal like a moose. Um, but the, the minimal number of cuts. And then don't skin it in the bush. Uh, I would drag it out. Unless you're really concerned about temperature, I would leave the hide on as long as possible till you're back to some sort of civilization. And that keeps mud and grime and dirt and leaves and hair off the meat. So if you can get it back to camp and lift it in any way, uh, that's the best way to skin is where the hide is falling off the carcass as you're lifting the carcass up. And f f funny also, a ratchet, <laughs> a ratchet strap and a stout, mm. a stout stick that isn't going to snap on you between the, the heels or the, the two tendons as a gambrel, or if, you have a, if you're fancy and you have a metal gambrel, um, a spreader bar between the knees, um, you can kind of ratchet strap it up into a tree and lift it as you're skinning it so that the hair and gravity is all pulling the, the, ha the loosened hairs as you're, as you're cutting through the hide. It's pulling it down. Usually when the an where the animal falls is a bad place to skin it because the ground is uneven inevitably and you're not using gravity to your advantage to pull that hair and hide away. So I would just gut it mm. and then load it, or get it back to a vehicle to load, to get it to camp somehow with the, the hide on. And then if you want to go even further, if the temperatures are ideal, like it's really cold, um, you can gut it and get air into the cavity and it cools from the inside of the animal, not from the outside of the animal. And Kevin uh, Kosawan, good, great friend, from the wild uh, filmographer, he actually aged uh, several deer one season in his cold room with the hide on. So he read this, it was European technique, and it worked magnificently. And it kind of goes against everything that a person would, th I don't know, you're like, how quick can I get my meat naked? And uh, that, I don't know where that comes from, but uh, uh, he's like, I, th I think that kind of like hanging a duck <laughs> hanging a duck and aging it till its head falls off or whatever. Like, I don't know. He's kind of on this kick. 
and we did we were experimenting with uh, extreme dry aging beef and he's like well if i leave the if i leave the hide on then what happens so it, it just aged with the fur on in his in his cold storage basement room and then before he wanted to it so it hung out there two three weeks and then he skinned it at home with really sharp knives and lots of time and he said it was perfect it was like virgin meat no hair no gravel no dust no That's spores cool. Because the hide stayed on right until he was ready to, to actually butcher the animal. Got a question here. This guy knows how to ask lots of questions in one sentence. He says, hang versus ice bath versus butcher straight away. I have a big 105 liter Coleman cooler, but no walk-in. Our second fridge is used for the house, but it isn't overly full. I've been doing an ice bath for seven to 10 days as per Von Benedict's podcast, drain the water every day, add ice as needed. Seems to work okay. This person says water at the end is much less bloody. I live in the lower mainland, so weather doesn't seem good to hang. A friend does, but uses commercial fans in his garage. What does hard meat layer do to the quality? So that's a whole bunch of stuff in one, in one uh, question there, but what would you have to say to that? Yeah. With regards to how do you get your meat cool safely and quickly, uh, and s as simply as possible. And this is a, a question from the lower mainland where temperatures aren't like they are in North central Alberta. So, um, I have to expand my mind a little bit. I, I've heard of the cold water bath method and uh, harvesting moose as a kid with the old men uh, when I was growing up. Uh, we used river water to cool the moose down when the temperatures were no good and the flies were bad. So an early season harvest, um, cold water was kind of the only option because we were, re were remote and uh, we had several days where, where the game wasn't going to be out at commercial refrigeration. Um, very interesting. Um, so there are some options and that is like, I, like a cold water bath or, uh, dry or a aging in air in, in cool air, ideally, um, in, you know, um, or butchering right away. And I would say the whole idea of aging is to make the animal, uh, increase in tenderness and, um, uh, decrease in its total water load. So it, it would concentrate flavor and increase tenderness by aging in air. Um, in an ice bath for multiple days, um, I would say that you're cooling it through, but you're probably not getting like water loss to concentrate flavor. There probably still would be enzymatic activity inside the meat, making it more tender. Um, so that would be applicable when you're dealing with like a bull, a bull animal or a male animal or an older animal. Um, you might want to do that for more tenderness. But your end use of the animal is probably something that would guide you uh, the most here, uh, because I think that a, a good option would be to butcher immediately. So, um, if you have one cool night where, or, or 12 hours in a cold water ice bath, uh, 12 hours, it's chilled through, um, then it's time to butcher, uh, again, depending on what you're planning to use the animal for. If a lot of it's going to, if it's an older animal, like a, a, a trophy animal, is an old buck or old bull. Mm. Um, a lot of it's going to, like if we're being honest with ourselves, a lot of it's going to go into grind. So I would say mm -hmm. you're not getting any meat benefits by aging that. Um, you're going to grind most of it. And the tender parts are already tender. T so on an older animal, like a trophy buck, I'd save the tenderloin, the strip and the ribeye, the strip loin and ribeye, and then probably grind or cube for stew or slow cooking most of the rest of it. So I think mm. that what you're trying to get out of like, aging in a traditional European slaughterhouse kind of idea. Um, it doesn't apply to wild game the same way. The reason that we do it with big fat beef and even big fat pigs, uh, aging works really well because they're just carpeted in lard, in fat. So mm. they have a, a wetsuit of a fat layer that can be trimmed off later. And so that means that they're just really great candidates. A big fat beef or a big fat pig, uh, hog, uh, are terrific candidates to age indefinitely because they're so loaded with that that sealing in the moisture and allowing mm -hmm. enzyma enzymatic activity to break down uh, the connective tissue in the meat. A lean wild animal, particularly a breeding bull or breeding buck, has little to no fat. And so in air, it dries out. And in water, this I want to get to this, the, in a cold water bath, you're risking spreading contamination. So if there's a bit of fecal right. matter or a bit of spores or contamination, like in the bath, then it gets, it's watered down, and so it's diluted, mm. but it, it could get all over the meat if you have some, something nasty in there. 
So I'd probably just go ahead and if I didn't have refrigeration uh, right away, I'd, I'd have the animal cool down and sort of like rigor mortis up and then butcher it right away, get it into a cooler on ice in at mm-hmm. least primals, like boneless primals. That's a great way to go. Because you're not going to improve uh, meat quality that much. If you're hunting just for meat and you're taking a fawn or a cow or something that's been fat shooting off here, it'd be like shooting a, mo- a cow moose off an alfalfa field, or sorry, mm. a- an alfalfa or canola field. That's a big, lardy, fat-ass animal. Yeah. So you can skin it uh, and, and chill it, and you're going to get some benefits by letting that thing age, the tenderness, because it's got a big, fat uh, jacket on. So it's retaining its moisture, retaining that juiciness, and then getting more tender. But usually mm. a bull or a buck um, is going to lose juiciness in exchange for tenderness. And then you're adding that whole meat contamination risk uh, from E. coli spreading. So I would just butcher right away. Butcher right away. Yeah, I like, you know, I had access deer for the first time. Uh, I did a hunt in Molokai and very hot, very hot weather over there. And uh, it, the meat immediately went into an ice bath, which was you know, something I've never done before and I've always kind of frowned upon. Um, and people talk about how Axis deer is like one of the best meats out there. That wasn't my assessment. I, I found it to be a very mild meat and I was wondering if that ice bath really kind of made it more mild and affected the texture as well. Yeah, I think it definitely would. Uh, we've had poultry, <laughs> uh, yeah, I, Definitely, uh, meat picks up water when it's in, so hot, hot meat going into cold bath picks up water in the fibers of the meat. So it would affect mm-hmm. your texture as well. Um, and so that's something like if you prefer it, if you prefer that texture, the, the texture and the extra weight, that's good. But, but I think that the risks of contamination is always a concern. Um, mm. as if I put on my, my retail meat vendor hat, I would sell, uh, uh, a cold air chilled chicken uh, for more than an ice water bath chicken. So an ice mm. water bath chicken goes into these cold water baths. Uh, that's how the mega processors do it to get those chickens cooled down more quickly with less real less real estate, less room. Uh, but mm. if there's some chicken shit in the water, that chicken shit is now on all the chickens. So the solution right. to that is usually to add to add a chemical. <laughs> an antibacterial chemical to the chicken bath. And then that's all being slurped up by the meat. So the meat right. itself, the muscles and the skin and all that is soaking in a shit chemical bath. <laughs> and yeah, that's a really texture, good point. And it also gives you, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like the chlorine in a swimming pool. Like someone just took a, a dump in your pool, but don't worry, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, don't, yeah. don't worry, it's, it's sterile. It's fine. And I'm like, I don't want to eat. It's fine. I don't want shit in my mouth that's sterile or active. I don't. I just assume yeah. to have neither. So, so in pol- sorry, but in, in poultry, then a, a air chilled is like this premium product. If the poultry is killed and then air chill- killed, washed off and then air chilled, um, that's mm-hmm. more desirable. Mm. Um, and you know, people talking about uh, different ways of cooling off their uh, their game. I always. Like I look at people, they buy meat grinders and they'll buy slicers and they'll buy all these different contraptions and why not just go on Craigslist and buy a used freezer and get a little temperature control for the thing. Um, other than storage space, you can get, a, or a used fridge, just something to hang your meat or hold your meat for a while in, in a cool area. It seems like that would be a, a pretty good investment if somebody plans to go out and get in more than one animal. Absolutely. I think planning your trip. Uh, I mean, this is a, an answer to an, a not exact, a, not a question, but an extension of, yep. the, of the previous one. And that's that um, there's so much money spent on camouflage and, mm. and knickknacks that are brick and brack that's all unnecessary. Um, if you were serious about what you want to do with your meat, then yeah, ice or uh, uh, a generator. A lot of guys are, are traveling with genera- generators anyway. So a, a window mm-hmm. rattling air conditioner in like a semi-insulated mm-hmm. plywood box would be would yep. be more useful than, uh, I don't know, what can I think of that I saw uh, recently? Like then a ghillie suit. I think that some <laughs> invest money <laughs> yes. in, in an air conditioner, a generator and, and a plywood box. And the ghillie yeah. suit probably is a bit of an overkill. Uh, I'd say so, yeah. Maybe just be still. You'll probably uh, find more... But yeah, it's really interesting. I don't know. I, I have a strong, strong feelings about the commercialization of hunting, and that they'll like that if it can be manufactured in China uh, for three cents and sold to North Americans for three hundred dollars, 
uh, that works and that gets promoted and pushed. But what doesn't mm -hmm. get pushed is exactly what you said is Craigslist or Kijiji or, or Facebook Marketplace and looking for that used fridge or the even used walk-ins are not expensive. If a couple of uh, uh, hunters working together, we're going to go plan a trip where they go into camp and they're going to set up and be like be in theater for 10 days. Mm -hmm. No matter what's harvested, no one's driving out. Then, then yeah, like a five by eight trailer with with spray foam insulation or some Dow foam and a, and an air conditioner running during the day would be would be really a lot smarter than uh, the lift kit and the uh, the ground mm -hmm. effects lighting and and the you know whatever whatever people are spending money on. You don't need a whiz bang rifle if all your meat just rots. <laughs> the, That's the a caliber, really really good point. The, yeah, get a three hundred three at a at a gun show. And uh, and wear like sneakers because mm -hmm. they're aw like sneakers are awesome disposable set of uh, inexpensive sneakers and just throw them out yep. every year and then go hunting and and maybe think about meat prep meat meat storage and preservation. I like that. Here's one. Uh, what do you think of Rene Redzepi's dry aging beef and beeswax? I think he had some like super old uh, uh, cow that he ended up. Um, Dry aging and beeswax. Did you follow that? Yeah, no, for sure. I saw that and I th thought super cool. We have uh, on the farm, we have bees, we have wax, and we've done it once. Uh, we did a strip loin in in lard, uh, in beef tallow, sorry, beef tallow. So dip, mm -hmm. uh, ice bath, like dip in, in hot tallow and then ice bath and dip in hot tallow. So the, the goal here from the meat weirdo perspective is that you're trying to minimize... Uh, the amount of trim loss that is called pellicol or uh, more commonly scab. So the dried mm. out husk of say a, a desirable cut of meat like strip loin or ribeye that is, is a cut that you'd want to super age. Um, if you just like cool or you just let it age in air, you get a gross bark or scab on the outside of the meat. And then you're trimming that down to just cut out the, the the bright red jewel in the center because most people are really put off by that this, that ugly looking bark mm -hmm. on the outside. So Rene Rezepe and others uh, dipping in fat means that you're you're not losing all you're not losing uh, moisture as quickly in the outer layer, so you have a higher yield on the cut because you're keeping the moisture in by dipping it in beeswax or lard. And beeswax and lard or or tallow are semi permeable to moisture and, and, and air. So there is some exchange. It's, mm. it's a little bit better than a plastic bag, but not a whole lot better than a plastic bag. So that would be something more akin to wet aging or bag aging. So you have to ask yourself what's more permeable, just a vac seal bag or wax. And both they're pretty close. Wax has a little more breathability mm. than, or, or, or lard tallow. Uh, but it's kind of like a wet aging technique. Um, Something that we've seen in in the world of uh, fermented dry cured sausage is using a bladder or the beef bung. So a scraped mm. out, like a very large, like the intestine or a bladder, a pork bladder or a humongous pork bladder. And now you can stuff sausage in that to make tradition, all kinds of traditional uh, dry cured fermented stuff. Um, and that is a, pe a permeable membrane. And there's a place, uh, I, ca I can't remember the name of the manufactured product, but they're dry aging bags that are sort of these semi-permeable bags made out of uh, collagen right. or something like that. So they breathe. That's a step closer, like a step away from plastic and closer to just dry aging in air. But uh, it's worth exploring. And like, imag I mean, uh, I wouldn't go through an inordinate amount of expense to experiment in this way. But if you liked the, re the effects yourself of, of aging in beeswax, Rene can do all kinds of crazy things because he's he's done really well for himself in, res in restauranting. Yeah. So I think in some ways, uh, it may be a bit for show. Like, what can we dip sure. this in with that? Like, how, like it's a little <laughs> bit excessive, but uh, sure. it's cool. It looked cool. And uh, if you're playful with your food, which you should be, and you want to experiment, there, I think that there might be some flavor notes in wax that affects the meat in a different way than with plastic or, or lard. So I, beeswax has a really... Uh, a pleasing smell and feel to it in, in my palate. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that would imp be imparted to the meat somewhat. Here's another one. Um, you may or may not know this one, but it says uh, considerations with deer and CWD, chronic wasting disease. 
Would you avoid cutting through bones and butchering to be extra safe? Yes. Um, it's an easy answer. Yeah, and, uh, yes. Mm, so, man, strong feelings on chronic wasting and strong feelings about uh, uh, mad cow, uh, bovine, spongioform, encephalopathy. So we're always not monitoring, but we're always mitigating the risk on the kill floor with beef for BSE, which is the bovine version of CWD. Um, and so we've read a lot and written a lot of procedures that you use a spinal severing knife that's a special knife to, to decapitate the animal. Whenever you're cutting through the spinal cord, the spinal cord is deemed specified risk material, and so you don't want that knife touching the rest of the, the, the edible part of the animal. So we have a special knife to sever the spinal cord, and particularly careful around animals over 30 months of age because mm. there's a higher, statistically higher probability of animals over 30 months of age having um, prions than animals under 30 months of age. So mm, Canada Food Inspection Agency kind of built all of these sort of, they had to just draw a line in the sand where statistical probabilities are used. It was a little bit like any public health emergency where it's not perfect, but they did the best they could to try and minimize the spread of. Um, so, so for BSE, we're rec not recommended, but it's required that you not eat uh, meat within one inch of the spinal cord, uh, where we remove and treat as specified risk material the first one and a half meters of small intestine. Mm. And eyes, brain, and spine are not used for food. So if you other bones are just uh, other bones and cutting other bones are are just fine. So I think that okay. sort of the the proxy for wild game and CWD would be to avoid spine, avoid severing the spine, and that's it's not that hard to do. So debone an older animal, uh, mm -hmm. debone it without cutting uh, down the spine with your reciprocating saw or, or your handsaw, whatever you have in camp. Just avoid the spine, head, brain, eyes, tonsils, and uh, the first and the small intestine get that away from the meat and then kind of avoid, e avoid eating meat within one inch of the spinal cord. And then you're doing the same thing that we're doing in the food industry for beef. Interesting. What about, what about marrow? Would that be a consideration? No, that's not a specified, like in, in the BSE world, that's not a specified risk material. So marrow okay. bones is that's still allowed. That's, that's not statistically a significant probability of prion source for a, uh, for a potentially infected animal in, in the world of, of beef. What I think is brilliant though, is that unlike beef in the, in the, in the, in the deer world, you can submit deer heads for testing no matter where it's harvested in Alberta. And I think that BC mm. has something similar. So, so you can get like, it, it's kind of funny that my family <laughs> can get a steak at, at, uh, at, at Walmart and eat that steak. And we don't know the animal was never tested for BSE or not. We're just hoping mm. that the, the federal processors kind of m d did things that we're, that the provincial processors also do to mitigate risk and sort of to, st mm. to avoid the st statistical probability in older animals, da, da, da. So they did something, but they, d they certainly didn't test it for BSE. There is a test for BSE that's just like the test they run on the heads of deer for chronic wasting except mm -hmm. that hunters get to have uh, a negative test result, whereas people shopping at Walmart, do, or shopping anywhere, we don't get a negative test result on, on beef. Interesting. Other countries and jurisdictions do test. They test for BSC on 100% of all beef slaughtered, like the mm -hmm. United Kingdom, but we don't do right. that here. However, hunt, hunters can submit that head to test for CWD to know that it's, you get the all clear. And chronic wasting is, I don't think there's any proven cases of chronic wasting jumping to humans, like, yet. Right. Uh, so Ke Kevin and I were hunting in southern Alberta and like 25% of deer, or I think the stat is even higher, um, are test positive for chronic wasting. Wow. Uh, and the, the official stance of the Alberta government says, we don't recommend you eating animals that test positive. Mm. Uh, and the results are usually a month or two from when you har from when you submit the the test. So, so we were kind of Kevin was in a shit position because he had one that tested hot, and he had already gone through the expense of, and time of of buying the tags, harvesting the animal, killing and gutting and skinning, and then butchering mm -hmm. and putting it in his freezer. But he didn't eat a speck of it until he got the test results, and the test results were positive. So he threw it all out at a landfill. They don't recommend oh, you feed man. CWD hot animals to to pets. 
Man. I would choose maybe not to hunt in areas where the prevalence is as high as 20 or 30 percent because I don't want to go because I don't have enough money to go through all of that and then just throw out the animal. I'm I'm still a poor member of the working poor enough that if I kill an animal, I want like we're in like a 95 percent CWD free zone. And I'm really glad that the government provides those statistics so that I can be reasonably assured that the animal doesn't have CWD. Again, noting to listeners that CWD isn't proven to do anything to humans. It's just advised that possibly because BSE did jump or has mm. been known to be able to jump and cause kurtzfeld jakob disease in humans, that probably you want to, <laughs> you want to simmer down on eating animals from wild animals that, that suffer from chronic wasting. That's so a it's, it's, it's a whole topic in, for, for a podcast uh, all, all on its own to bring specialists I think in and so. talk about where are, we at with, yeah, where are we at with CWD in Canada and, and in jurisdictions like in the States where it's much more prevalent. What are they doing? So here's another one. Person says, I, run, I render bear and deer tallow. What do you suggest is the shelf life in a fridge? He says, smells all right after a few years. So I guess if it passes a smell test, we're good. Yeah, it's funny. There's this like this freaky book that have, that my wife bought when we were new to farming called Nourishing Traditions. And mm. uh, it was about fermented and fermenting foods and uh, eating raw dairy and stuff like that. Uh, and it really did say that that human beings uh, need to be able to trust their senses of taste and smell. Mm -hmm. And if it's off putting it. to smell, then don't use it. Yeah. I love it. it was as simple as that. And uh, I think that we, we really underplay our senses and that you could probably, if it doesn't smell good, then don't use it. We've noticed that rendered lard in the freezer probably has, depending on what else is in your freezer, probably has a six-month shelf life before the fat tastes rancid. Because right. of the zero water content, that fat and rendered fat doesn't permanently, it doesn't freeze. It just hardens mm. or like stiffens. Mm -hmm. But so there's always activity going on in fat and it can go rancid. And if you use even a little bit of rancid pork lard in a dish, the dish is ruined. That's so right. I wouldn't be afraid to smell it and or taste it uh, to, to see. Now, that being said, uh, there's always a use for lard, particularly bear fat or deer fat, to waterproof your boots, uh, to mm -hmm. waterproof and treat leathers. Um, so even if it's no longer culinarily useful... Uh, it can be used to to treat leather, to treat fabrics, to be water resistant, waterproof. I like that. Here's here's a neat one. So when people look at the liver on an animal to see if it's healthy, what are they looking for? And are there any other ways to check the health of an animal through its organs? Now that's a terrific one, and we've seen in 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 the, in the because it's the case that we've been running the slaughterhouse for thirteen years. We've seen a lot of organs. <laughs> And yep. the, because there's an inspector there checking, doing postmortems on the organs to see if the animal's fit for human consumption, they almost always are because even afflictions of the organs uh, don't require that we toss away the carcass, uh, but it does require that we don't consume or that the, the organs themselves are not fit for human consumption. And I think like a great rule of thumb, kind of the follow-up to the, the kind of the nourishing traditions, like trust your senses on, of smell, uh, mm -hmm. When a liver is bad, a liver is a great one because it's like a huge canvas of the animal's life. Like it's a canvas and an, an atlas, a map of what what the animal's done, the, what, what it's been up to the last few years. Mm. Uh, has it had a healthy lifestyle or has it been uh, getting blackout drunk on weekends or <laughs> more likely uh, dining... <laughs> Dining on things that aren't good for it or dining in sloughs where there are parasites. And mm. so, so anyway, my long answer, but if it looks disgusting, throw it away. You will know a bad liver when you see it. Um, mm. Man, there are liver flukes that are kind of like leeches, small leeches that live in livers uh, that usually hang out in sloughs and wetlands. And they occur in all ungulates or multi-chamber stomach, stomached animals. Uh, and when the liver has flukes and you see things moving in the liver, it's bad news about the liver, uh, throw mm. it away. Also those flukes or milder infections of parasites can leave scarring on the liver, uh, on the liver. So if it's not a nice, smooth, beautiful mahogany colored liver with no white bumps or white spots, then it's a mm. healthy liver. If it has white spots, white bumps, uh, pustules, uh, sacs filled with pus or gross little squirmy animals, then that like... That's a condemnation of the liver and the organs. 
and I'd kind of be careful about the rest of the animal. H- however, in in bovines, uh, those parasite the parasites that love eating uh, organs don't love uh, infesting the meat. So the meat is hmm. usually still just fine if the livers are condemned and thrown into the garbage, not fit for, even for dog food. So keep an eye on the liver. Um, you would look for swelling in glands like the tonsils uh, up up in the throat at the base of the tongue. If there's anything swollen or any uh, infections, uh, you might want to talk to a veterinarian in your area to just make sure that the meat would be healthy. Taking biopsies in little weird little um, Ziploc bags is not the worst idea if you're if you're unsure. It's better safe than sorry. And uh, I'm not, I, I wish I was more familiar in British Columbia, but there is a lab in Edmonton that would take weird biopsies. Uh, it's it's an extension of uh, like fish and what, what used to be called fish and wildlife anyway, but uh, the fish and wildlife department would take, it's where you submit your heads. Right. Uh, for chronic wasting testing. If you, if you drive right to a center. But you could you could you could bring biopsies, and I think a lot of the people that work in that field are quite interested to find rare and unusual conditions. So if you're unsure, uh, put it, yeah, freeze the meat, like like harvest the meat, save it, maybe save save a liver that looks disgusting. But if it looks disgusting, it's because it's bad. Mm. Yeah, makes sense. Um, Better to age meat on or off the bone? Uh, um, Great question. If the animal. So if the animal is chilled right through and you're managing temperature properly uh, by getting it gutted and skinned quickly after the harvest, uh, then leaving it on the bone is better because you have less overall surface area to lose yield due to scab or Mm. helicose or bark. So so I'm thinking of a big, uh, the hip, the, 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 the ass end of a deer, the rear mm. quarter, the rear hip of it, um, the more the, the more big pieces you can keep it in, the bigger the piece you can keep it in, the less surface area it is for water to evaporate. Um, and leaving leaving the bone in, and, and if you were, if you did have a saw and you split the animal straight down uh, the center into sides, um, those feather bones of the spine keep your ribeye and your strip loin protected because they're a bit of armor that protects water from evaporating from the bone side. So keeping mm. the bone, keeping it on the bone is the best way in the biggest piece possible. That's the best way to dry age. Okay. And again, again um, less surface area means less water loss. And the whole point of dry aging is keeping water in the muscle while enzymatic activity breaks down the muscle and the connective tissue to make it more tender. So mm. the more water you lose, the more redundant aging is. If you're losing a lot of water, if the animal's not coated in fat, or if it's a bunch of small pieces, you're just gonna you're gonna lose water, so it's gonna make it dry, but the enzymatic activity will make it tender, but it'll be dry and tender, mm. and so you're undoing the tenderness is being undone because you're losing juiciness. So just butcher it as soon as it's cold through. Right. Okay. So here's one about meat curing: sodium nitrate versus sodium nitrite. Brands advertise nitrate or nitrate. Nitrate or nitrite-free products, but use celery extract. And what's the difference? Funny. Uh, we went on a wild goose chase to try and get celery extract, which which turned out to be another name for sodium nitrite. Sodium mm. nitrite uh, is the curing ingredient in pink salt, or like there's it goes by a lot of different names: cure salt, pink salt, number two, prag mm. powder. Uh, they all contain a percentage of sodium nitrite. And then as it oxidizes, it becomes sodium nitrate. And that, ni- that sodium nitrate is sort of the, uh, the reduced version of sodium, sodium nitrite after it's done its work, glomming onto oxygen to, per- to, to do its preservative work in meat. Uh, so it's all the same, that, that, that as a cure... You're not really saving yourself if you invest in celery extract. It's it's this it's chemically the same thing. Interesting. Um, unless you were making your own. Yeah, yeah. It was really disappointing. Like we're gonna buy a bag of this stuff, the celery extract from Norway for eight hundred dollars, mm. and um, the, it was chemically no different from chemically produced, or like a uh, artificially produced sodium nitrite. That's then watered down and bonded with salt. So it's a low, it's not a hundred percent sodium nitrite that would kill everybody. It's mm. usually down at two percent or five percent, and then you have to adjust your recipes. Uh, uh, it in small quantities if you're not eating thousands or 
dozens of pounds of, of cured meats. Uh, I don't think that the health consequences outweigh the novelty of having uh, food preservation. And it has great color. It, it, it changes the flavor in your bacons and hams. And it changes the color, changes the flavor, and it extends the, the, the shelf stability of, that, of those products. So I'm an advocate of, of cure salt to make cured meat products. Um, that being said, I wouldn't eat 100 pounds of them a month because you just don't need that much sodium nitrate in your diet. And the yeah. oxidized version, sodium nitrate in your diet. Um, so, so just be reason, be reasonable. It's been something that's been around for curing for hundreds of years, and uh, uh, but but eat responsibly. Uh, there are, are alternatives, and thinking that you need uh, cure salt in order to produce a delicious salted meat is not true. Uh, it makes a very specific type of product, but if you're averse or allergic or other health reasons that you, makes you want to avoid cure salt, um, then just explore using salt and smoke. Uh, that's mm. an even more ancient traditional method, but just salt, uh, iodine-free, so sea, sea salt, and thyme in the Italian tradition of whole muscle curing uh, works quite lovely. Um, you don't get sort of the same color and the same uh, tinny flavor as in like an American uh, cure salt cured ham or bacon. Mm. But we've done, and we don't get the same color, but we've done uh, sodium nitrate free bacon um, and it's just salt and sugar on side pork and then sliced. It's kind of, it doesn't have the nice color, but it's it's also very, very close to bacon. That sounds delicious. Um, this person, Hunter, says I've, Got a good grinder and I wrap my meat in paper. What are some next investment ideas? Is it smoker, vacuum packer, meat band saw? And then if vacuum packer, he hears that they tend to break every few seasons and maybe there's some good suggestions out there. That's a really good question. He's right about vacuum packers being disproportionately expensive and mm. that they don't, they don't last. There's a lot of things that can go wrong. So they can lose seals. And the heating elements can make crappy seals. So if you're not harvesting a huge number of animals per year um, and you're intermittent, you know, it's like say you're an intermittent harvester or you're harvesting a couple of deer per year, I think that you're on the right track with paper wrapping, um, using the animal up in a reasonable amount of time. Like if, if you have six years or six year old game meat in your freezer, you're doing it wrong. You're probably hunting too mm. much or you're not giving it away to family <laughs> enough. So the kind of mummifying animal, like meats that's harvested for, for, men, for more than one season or maybe two, you're either harvesting too much or you're not giving away enough or, or you're just not cooking with it often enough. Mm. Uh, so I, I think that for this, like a non-commercial uh, like kind of hobby hunter, probably you'd have a lot more fun with a smoke, like with a smoker because you, it gives you access to a whole, uh, breadth of products that you can you can at home manufacture to have to have things that the family likes eating more so then like so that you're solving the problem by making more delicious things in a wider mm. scope of flavors than just storing meat that nobody likes eating <laughs> longer yeah <laughs> so the pepperoni at my house when i was a kid like we'd eat a whole moose worth of pepperoni every year like playing video wow. games eating pepperoni or jerky so I think that probably going down that path isn't a bad idea because smoke and salt and sugar make meat delicious. You can make an alley cat into some delicious jerky, I think, with, <laughs> with a prepackaged jerky mix and a smoker. Yeah. I would eat I'm alley cats. I'm going to quote you on that one. one. I think. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> last, last one I got here is moose nose. Is it kind of like the ultimate foundation for head cheese? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think easily the proxy and probably like the culinary French, uh, Western European world would be, uh, head cheese is a proxy to moose nose. It's, it's cartilaginous and, uh, man, we did some gross things with pig faces, uh, mm. where they're scalded and scraped, of course, during the processing. And then we debone the entire pig face mm -hmm. and then we rolled it up ears, ears, cartilage and all, and then tied them in a tight little bundle uh, wrapped around bay leaf and various herbs and then essentially uh, uh, braised that, that rolled up and tightly tied face in a roll for hours and hours and hours. And hmm. then, I don't know what, what the process was. I think it went into um, 
the, it was just poured into into pans to cool, like into a bread loaf pan, yeah, to, to make just the world's the world's like least fancy head cheese, and then we sliced it. And when you're eating this, so it was like brown jello, like really really dense brown jello, with mm. this curl of pig skin, snout, ears, and all kinds of and the little bits of meat and fat in it. It was absolutely delicious, which is gross, but it the, sounds the good. texture was a bit getting around because, yeah. Yeah, you could slice it and put it on on uh, in a sandwich, and you almost wouldn't know that it wasn't just a luncheon meat. It just tasted like a delicious pork luncheon meat, except really? for when you got a piece of the cartil- <laughs> the cartilage in the ear. Again, edible and chewable, and was fine. Like it wasn't bony or gristly because it had been yeah. braised for so long. The cartilage just turned into something a little firmer bit of 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 gristle in there. So. I, I would highly anticipate that mo- the moose cartilage would eventually, with enough braising, it would sort of melt down into a sticky, tacky, quite enjoyable bit, kind of like a tendon in your Vietnamese soup at your Vietnamese takeout place, uh, or a little bit like a chewy noodle, mm. like uh, 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 tripe, like beef tripe yeah. in either an Italian cultural tradition, a French cultural tradition, or uh, an Asian cultural tradition, kind of like chewy noodle. And once you get used to it, you kind of like, I quite like this. It's super rich. Like all of those mm-hmm. foods, the coll- collagenous foods are quite rich. Head cheese and nose, you probably wouldn't sit down and eat like a pound of it. But um, I'm, I'm pretty keen on trying moose nose the next time I harvest a moose to see where, where it goes. And if we can kind of amp it up, like they're, they're probably the, the traditional preparation methods. Uh, but I wonder if you could kind of build a hybrid of of scorching it and and cooking it in a campfire like wrapped in the stomach of the of the moose that's one way to do it and then that huh. like hyper traditional hyper stone age yeah. yeah um but if you brought in some culinary techniques from western europe or even from asia you might be able to like approach it as if it were a pig's face or pig ears and make it in, into a collagen a, like a collagen delicacy or or kind of a moose head cheese yeah so for the listeners, next time you're out there and you got your moose nose, just wrap it in a pig's face or uh, treat treat it like a pig's face. There you go. Yeah, I would say Google uh, head cheese recipes and then apply them to your moose nose recipe. And I think you're going to be okay. Like you're going to be <laughs> close. You're going to get there close. But practice makes perfect. I can only imagine what the, uh, a non-hunter, non-meat eater tuning into this podcast would have to think. Is there anything we should chat about before we wrap things up? I was pretty keen on on promoting the lifestyle of living on land, uh, living on like uh, in rural areas. Mm-hmm. I think that reasonable people would would at least consider and like poke it a little bit because of the costs. It, there's sort of a metaphor in the cost of meat when the grocers are gouging has made the artisanal butcher modest meats not the highest price to buy your meat at us which is weird we're cheaper than Mm. costco and i'm getting all the margin i want like a reasonable amount of margin on my wagyu 60 day dry edge wagyu we're selling at 77 a kg for a bone and rib and costco is selling a factory bone and rib for 99 a kg and i'm like what the how is that fucking possible and it's because the grocers got a taste of fucking people so hard during COVID that mm. they're like, there's no reason. What can they do? What can mm. shoppers do? What, are they all going to buy a fucking farm? Are they all going to mm. go hunting? Of course they're not, right? Mm. <laughs> it's too hard. And like, they've been programmed, they've, they've been too dumbed down and they've been made too sedentary and too filled with depression and anxiety to actually become hunters and farmers. They're not going to do that. They're just going to pay ninety nine dollars for a mislabeled ribeye. Just going to pay for it. Con- just going to pay for it. Convenience is the addiction, right? So, and and that that had sort of uh, consumers in, in between a rock and a hard place, and and then COVID sort of just proved that to the mega corporations that two or five, like food retailers in Canada, that can just charge whatever they want. So it made artisanal meat seem not that expensive because it's not that expensive when you have a short supply chain. That's crazy. So that was good. But but I liken that to sort of like the land idea. Oh, was that then in the real estate field? So this is a metaphor that the grocery fuckers are, are sort of a metaphor for the real estate people that are fucking you also as a, as a member of the working class. Real estate developers are like, 
we can just charge whatever we want for houses as mm-hmm. evidenced by house prices in 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 cities that are getting less and less desirable if we just do a reality check and say that is this how i want to live <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> like with with break-ins Daily. And, and just people on top of each other and and concrete and noise and pollution and like all that stuff if you really just ask yourself is this what i how i want to spend the rest of my i'm on like there's the, the statistical likelihood of me even existing is one in a gajillion and then I'm going to like, I'm going to take a train to work and be packed in like a sardine and on the train for an hour and a half. And then some dude farts and I just have to smell it <laughs> because I can't get out of the way because I'm just packed in. Like, this is yep. one of the things that made me leave uh, Calgary. But so, so you're like, farted. this is the best, this is the highest. Someone would fart and you just have to smell it because. You and then you're like, oh, that's it. I'm out of Calgary. On the, yeah. I was like, this is the end. It, civilization is over. What the city has on offer the pros don't outweigh the cons. And that was when a fucking house in Calgary is $400,000. The same oh, house yeah. is $1.6 million today. So yeah. then we're, we're in Vancouver. We're dropping off these kittens and we go downtown to West Vancouver. Mm. And I drive past a, du- like a multiplex where they're building houses and selling them to people that are literally 10 feet wide. In mm-hmm. the country, we call those ATCO trailers stacked. They yes. just took, I'm like, Heather, you're never going to believe this. They have Atco, they have a 10 foot wide con or like condo in like a three or four story walk up, but there's like 70 units just all stacked together, but they're actually like 10 foot wide houses. Mm. And then I asked Annika, Google these like uh, ones for sale, Google $995,000. Man. And I'm like, these people, so, so the real estate guys are, are fucking people really, really hard. They're like, oh, but mm. how could you not want to live in the city? And then when with you have, uh, you have oligarchs that are burying money and buying condos downtown to jack the prices, gentrifying our like neighborhoods in Toronto mm. and Vancouver as good and stable investments. Sure. I can't really blame them. That's where I'd park my money too if I had tons and tons of it. But it means sure. that it drives up prices for people living there. So you can buy a shoebox Atco trailer for 995000 in Vancouver and live in Vancouver. And your dog doesn't have a place to take a shit that isn't concrete because yeah. there is no places that aren't concrete within a walkable distance to this area. So I was like, oh my God, it's so weird. So, so, the way, so now all of a sudden, rural, air, rural living <laughs> doesn't look as horrible. You're like, wait a second, look. honey. So I, I could tell it. I could probably telecommute, thanks to technology, and I could buy 160 acres for 300 grand, or 160 acres with with a house on it for five or 600 grand. And mm-hmm. the answer is true, my son. That's true. And then, so so it's possible that we're entering into a period of time where just people problem solving to have the least shitty life that they can might choose a house on every quarter section, a pig in every yard. Mm. I like that. Yeah, I think there's a lot to be said for that. It's it's possible that you don't pick up warm dog poop with your hand through a thin plastic bag because that's where it's at in the city. <laughs> uh, of course, pick up your dog poop. If sure, everyone sure. with a dog in Vancouver let their dog shit all over the place, they, you'd have to have swimming goggles to get down the streets, of course. I don't know how much about downtown Vancouver you've been through, but I think there's more human feces on the streets <laughs> still than a lot there of is shit. dog. That's human, sh- that's human shit. That's human shit. Hmm. Um, but our dog has never seen pavement, right? Mm. And what would you, what is that worth? What is that worth to you? If, if your dog has never experienced pavement or concrete. I don't know. And like, it's weird. Anyway, so, a lot. yeah, you're on, you're, yeah, you're on the phone with someone from 1930 and he's telling you like, how do you live like that? Or I don't mean you specifically, but I just sure. mean like they've bamboozled, they've bamboozled to the point and sort of taken like the, the realtors in this case have taken away from a, a working family so much that even the horribleness of living on a farm because of weather and freezing water and managing all your own systems is still better <laughs> than, the, than the option of leaving a, a $900,000 mortgage to your children instead of a paid off quarter section to your children. Yeah. In my lifetime, I'll be able to pay off 160 acres and give 40 acres each to each of my four daughters. But if I had a million dollar mortgage, which would be a normal starter house in Vancouver, I, even on a 30 year term, I wouldn't even have put a dent in it if my payments mm. were e- anywhere near reasonable on my income. Even as an accountant with two degrees from university, I would have a hard time accumulating any equity except for the equity of increasing property value. But 
that's only good if you leave that market. It's only good when you leave the market. You yeah. having a bunch of equity in your house in Vancouver doesn't do you any good unless you leave because you can just buy the same house as what you're living in with your equity. <laughs> it's hard to it's hard to climb the ladder if you're just a working person and you didn't inherit wealth. You know what? Thank you so much for being on the podcast. I always enjoy chatting with you and man, did I learn a lot. Well, thank you very much for having me, Travis. Anytime, man. Mm-hmm.